Section 6 of The Plain Speaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dave Gower. The Plain Speaker. Opinions on Books, Men, and Things by William Hazlitt. Section 6. On Reason and Imagination. I hate people who have no notion of anything but generalities and forms and creeds and naked propositions, even worse than I dislike those who cannot for the soul of them arrive at the comprehension of an abstract idea. There are those, even among philosophers, who, deeming that all truth is contained within certain outlines and common topics, if you proceed to add color or relief from individuality, protest against the use of rhetoric as an illogical thing, and if you drop a hint of pleasure or pain, as ever entering into this breathing world, raise a prodigious outcry against all appeals to the passions. It is, I confess, strange to me that men who pretend to more than usual accuracy in distinguishing and analyzing should insist that in treating of human nature, of moral good and evil, the nominal differences are alone of any value, or that in describing the feelings and motives of men, anything that conveys the smallest idea of what those feelings are in any given circumstances, or can by parity of reason ever be in any others, is a deliberate attempt at artifice and delusion, as if a knowledge or representation of things as they really exist, rules and definitions apart, was a proportionable departure from the truth. They stick to the table of contents, and never open the volume of the mind. They are for having maps, not pictures of the world we live in. As much as to say that a bird's eye view of things contains the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. If you want to look for the situation of a particular spot, they turn to a pasteboard globe on which they fix their wandering gaze, and because you cannot find the object of your search in their bald abridgments, tell you there is no such place, or that it is not worth inquiring after. They had better confine their studies to the celestial sphere and the signs of the zodiac, for they will meet with no petty details to boggle at or contradict their vague conclusions. Such persons would make excellent theologians, but are very indifferent philosophers. To pursue this geographical reasoning a little farther, they may say that the map of a country or shire, for instance, is too large and conveys a disproportionate idea of its relation to the whole. And we say that their map of the globe is too small, and conveys no idea of it at all. Quote, I the world's volume, our Britain shows as of it, but not in it. In a great pool a swan's nest. End quote. But is it really so? What, the country is bigger than the map at any rate? The representation falls short of the reality by a million degrees, and you would admit it altogether in order to arrive at a balance of power in the non-entities of the understanding and call this keeping within the bounds of sense and reason, and whatever does not come from within those self-made limits, is to be set aside as frivolous or monstrous. But there are more things between heaven and earth than were ever dreamt of in this philosophy. They cannot get them all in of the size of life, and therefore they reduce them on a graduated scale, till they think they can. So be it for certain necessary and general purposes, and in compliance with the infirmity of human intellect, but at other times, let us enlarge our conceptions to the dimensions of the original objects, nor let it be pretended that we have outraged truth and nature, because we have encroached on your diminutive mechanical standard. There is no language, no description that can strictly come up with the truth and force of reality. All we have to do is to guide our descriptions and conclusions by the reality. A certain proportion must be kept. We must not invert the rules of moral perspective. Logic should enrich and invigorate its decisions by the use of imagination, as rhetoric should be governed by its application and guarded from abuse by the checks of the understanding. Neither, I apprehend, is sufficient alone. The mind can conceive only one or a few things in their integrity. If it proceeds to more, it must have recourse to artificial substitutes, and judge by comparison merely. In the former case, it may select the least worthy, and so distort the truth of things by giving a hasty preference. In the latter, the danger is that it may refine and abstract so much as to attach no idea at all to them corresponding with their practical value or their influence on the minds of those concerned with them. Men act from individual impressions, and to know mankind, we should be acquainted with nature. 
Men act from passion, and we can only judge of passion by sympathy. Persons of the dry and husky class above spoken of often seem to think even nature itself an interloper on their flimsy theories. They prefer the shadows in Plato's cave to the actual objects without it. They consider men as nice in an air pump, fit only for their experiments, and do not consider the rest of the universe, or all the mighty world of eye and ear, as worth any notice at all. This is making short, but not sure work. Truth does not lie in vacuo, any more than in a well. We must improve our concrete experience of persons and things into the contemplation of general rules and principles, but without being grounded in individual facts and feelings, we shall end as we begun, in ignorance. It is mentioned in a short account of the last moments of Mr. Fox, that the conversation at the house of Lord Holland, where he died, turning upon Mr. Burke's style, that noble person objected to it as too gaudy and meretricious, and said that it was more profuse of flowers than fruit, on which Mr. Fox observed that, though this was a common objection, it appeared to him altogether an unfounded one, that, on the contrary, the flowers often concealed the fruit beneath them, and the ornaments of style were rather an hindrance than an advantage to the sentiments they were meant to set off. In confirmation of this remark, he offered to take down the book and translate a page anywhere into his own plain, natural style, and by his doing so, Lord Holland was convinced that he had often missed the thought of having his attention drawn off to the dazzling imagery. Thus, people continually find fault with the colors of style as incompatible with the truth of the reasoning, but without any foundation whatever. If it were a question about the figures of two triangles, and any person were to object that one triangle was green and the other yellow, and to bring this to bear upon the acuteness or obtuseness of the angles, it would be obvious to remark that the color had nothing whatever to do with the question. But in a dispute whether two objects are colored alike, the discovery that one is green and the other yellow is fatal. So, with respect to moral truth, as distinct from mathematical, whether a thing is good or evil depends on the quantity of passion, of feeling of pleasure and pain connected with it, and with which we must be made acquainted in order to come to a sound conclusion, and not in the inquiry whether it is round or square. Passion, in short, is the essence, the chief ingredient in moral truth, and the warmth of passion is sure to kindle the light of imagination on the objects around it. The words that glow are almost inseparable from the thoughts that burn. Hence, logical reason and practical truth are disparate. It is easy to raise an outcry against violent invectives, to talk loud against extravagance and enthusiasm, to pick a quarrel with everything but the most calm, candid, and qualified statements of fact, but there are enormities to which no words can do adequate justice. Are we then in order to form a complete idea of them, to omit every circumstance of aggravation, or to suppress every feeling of impatience that arises out of the details, lest we should be accused of giving way to the influence of prejudice and passion? This would be to falsify the impression altogether, to misconstrue reason, and fly in the face of nature. Suppose, for instance, that in the discussions on the slave trade, a description to the life was given of the horrors of the middle passage, as it was termed, that you saw the manner in which thousands of wretches, year after year, were stowed together in the hold of a slave ship, without air, without light, without food, without hope, so that what they suffered in reality was brought home to you in imagination, so you felt in sickness of heart as one of them. Could it be said that this was a prejudging of the case, that your knowing the extent of the evil disqualified you from pronouncing sentence upon it, and that your disgust and abhorrence were the effects of a heated imagination? No. Those evils that inflame the imagination and make the heart sick ought not to leave the head cool. This is the very test and measure of the degree of the enormity, and it involuntarily staggers and appalls the mind. If it were a common iniquity, if it were slight and partial, or necessary, it would not have this effect. But it very properly carries away the feelings and, if you will, overpowers the judgment, because it is a mass of evil so monstrous and unwarranted as not to be endured even in thought. A man on the rack does not suffer the less because the extremity of anguish takes away his command of feeling and attention to appearances. A pang inflicted on humanity is not the less real because it stirs up sympathy in the breast of humanity. 
Would you tame down the glowing language of justifiable passion into that of cold indifference or self-complacent skeptical reasoning, and thus take out the sting of indignation from the minds of the spectator? Not, surely, till you have removed the nuisance by the levers that strong feelings alone can set at work, and have thus taken away the pang of suffering that caused it. Or say that the question were proposed to you, whether on some occasion you should thrust your hand into the flames, and were coolly told that you were not at all to consider the pain and anguish it might give you, nor suffer yourself to be led away by any such idle appeals to natural sensibility, but to refer the decision to some abstract technical ground of propriety. Would you not laugh in your adviser's face? Oh, no. Where our own interests are concerned, or where we are sincere in our professions of regard, the pretended distinction between sound judgment and lively imagination is quickly done away with. But I would not wish a better or more philosophical standard of morality than that we should think and feel towards others, as we should if it were our own case. If we look for a higher standard than this, we should not find it but shall lose the substance for the shadow. Again, suppose an extreme or individual instance is brought forward in any general question, as that of the cargo of six slaves that were thrown overboard as so much live lumber by the captain of a guinea vessel in the year 1775, which was one of the things that first drew the attention of the public to this nefarious traffic, or the practice of suspending contumacious negroes in cages to have their eyes pecked out and to be devoured alive by birds of prey. Does this form no rule, because the mischief is solitary or excessive? The rule is absolute, for we feel that nothing of the kind could take place or be tolerated for an instant in any system that was not rotten at the core. If such things are ever done in any circumstances with impunity, we know what must be done every day under the same sanction. It shows that there is an utter deadness to every principle of justice or feeling of humanity, and where this is the case, we may take out our tables of abstraction and set down what is to follow through every gradation of petty, galling, vexation, and wanton, unrelenting cruelty. A state of things where a single instance of the kind can possibly happen without exciting general consternation ought not to exist for half an hour. The parent, hydra-headed injustice, ought to be crushed at once with all its viper brood, practices the mention of which make the flesh creep and that affront the light of day ought to be put down the instant they are known, without inquiry and without appeal. There was an example of eloquent moral questioning connected to this subject given in the work just referred to, which was not the less solid and profound because it was produced by a burst of strong personal and momentary feeling. It is what follows, quote, The name of a person having been mentioned in the presence of Nambana, a young African chieftain, who was understood by him to have publicly asserted something very degrading to the general character of Africans, he broke out into violent and vindictive language. He was immediately reminded of the Christian duty of forgiving his enemies, upon which he answered nearly in the following words, If a man should rob me of my money, I can forgive him. If a man should shoot at me or try to stab me, I can forgive him. If a man should sell me and all my family to a slave ship, so that we should pass all the rest of our days in slavery in the West Indies, I can forgive him. But, added he, rising from his seat with much emotion, if a man takes away the character of the people of my country, I can never forgive him. Being asked why he would not extend his forgiveness to those who took away the character of the people of his country, he answered, if a man should try to kill me or sell me and my family for slaves, he would do an injury to as many as he might kill or sell. But if anyone takes away the character of black people, that man injures black people all over the world. And when he has once taken away their character, there is nothing which he may not do to black people ever after. That man, for instance, will beat black men and say, Oh, it is only a black man, why should I not beat him? That man will make slaves of black people, for when he has taken away their character, he will say, Oh, they are only black people, why should I not make them slaves? That man will take all the people of Africa, if he can catch them. And if you ask him, but why do you take away all these people, he will say, Oh, they are only black people. They are not like white people. Why should I not take them? That is the reason why I cannot forgive the man who takes away the character of the people of my country. End quote.
I conceive more real light and vital heat is thrown into the argument by this struggle of natural feeling to relieve itself from the weight of a false and injurious imputation than would be added to it by twenty volumes of tables and calculations of the pros and cons of right and wrong, of utility and inutility in Mr. Bentham's handwriting. In allusion to this celebrated person's theory of morals, I will here go a step further and deny that the dry calculation of consequences is the sole and unqualified test of right and wrong, for we are to take into account, as well, the reaction of these consequences upon the mind of the individual and the community. In morals, the cultivation of a moral sense is not the last thing to be attended to, nay, it is the first. Almost the only unsophisticated or spirited remark that we meet with in Paley's moral philosophy is one which is always to be found in Tucker's Light of Nature, namely, that in dispensing charity to common beggars, we are not to consider so much the good it may do to the object of it, as the harm it will do to the person who refuses it. A sense of compassion is involuntarily excited by the immediate appearance of distress, and a violence and injury is done to the kindly feelings by withholding the obvious relief, the trifling pittance, in our power. This is a remark I think worthy of the ingenious and amiable author from whom Paley borrowed it. So with respect to the atrocities committed in the slave trade, it could not be set up as a doubtful plea in their favor, that the actual and intolerable sufferings inflicted on the individuals were compensated by certain advantages in a commercial and political point of view. In a moral sense, they cannot be compensated. They hurt the public mind, they harden and scar the natural feelings. The evil is monstrous and palatable. The pretended good is remote and contingent. In morals, as in philosophy, de non apparentibus et non existentibus eadem est ratio. What does not touch the heart or come home to the feelings goes comparatively for little or nothing. A benefit that exists merely in possibility and is judged of only by the forced dictates of the understanding is not a set-off against an evil say of equal magnitude in itself, that strikes upon the senses, that haunts the imagination, and lacerates the human heart, a spectacle of deliberate cruelty, that shocks everyone that sees and hears of it, is not to be justified by any calculations of cold-blooded self-interest, is not to be permitted in any case, it is prejudged and self-condemned, necessity has been therefore justly called the tyrant's plea, it is no better than the mere doctrine of utility, which is the sophist's plea. Thus, for example, an infinite number of lumps of sugar put into Mr. Bentham's artificial ethical scales would never weigh against the pounds of human flesh or drops of human blood that are sacrificed to produce them. The taste of the former on the palate is evanescent, but the others sit heavy on the soul. The one are an object to the imagination, the others only to the understanding. But man is an animal compounded both of imagination and understanding, and in treating of what is good for man's nature, it is necessary to consider both. A calculation of the mere ultimate advantages, without regard to natural feelings and affections, may improve the external face and physical comforts of society, but it will leave it heartless and worthless in itself. In a word, the sympathy of the individual, with the consequences of his own act, is to be attended to no less than the consequences themselves, in every sound system of morality, and this must be determined by certain natural laws of the human mind, and not by rules of logic or arithmetic. The aspect of a moral question is to be judged of, very much like the faces of a country, by the projecting points, by what is striking and memorable, by that which leaves the traces of itself behind, or casts its shadow before. Millions of acres do not make a picture, nor the calculation of all the consequences in the world, a sentiment. We must have some outstanding object for the mind, as well as the eye, to dwell on, and to recur to, something marked and decisive to give a tone and texture to the moral feelings. Not only is the attention thus aroused and kept alive, but what is most important as to the principles of action, the desire of good or hatred of evil, is powerfully excited. But all individual facts and in history come under the head of what these people call imagination. All full, true, and particular accounts they consider as romantic, ridiculous, vague, inflammatory. 
As a case in point, one of this school of thinkers declares that he was qualified to write a better history of India from having never been there than if he had, as if the last might lead to local distinctions or party prejudices, that is to say, that he could describe a country better at second hand than from original observation, or that from having seen no one object, place, or person, he could do ampler justice to the whole. It might be maintained, much on the same principle, that an artist would better paint a likeness of a person after he was dead from description, or different sketches of the face, than from having seen the individual living man. On the contrary, I humbly conceive that the seeing half a dozen wandering Lascars in the streets of London gives one a better idea of the soul of India, that cradle the world, and, as it were, garden of the sun, than all the charts, records, and statistical reports that can be sent over, even under the classical administration of Mr. Caning. Ab uno disque omnes. One Hindu differs more from a citizen of London than he does from all other Hindus and by seeing the two first, man to man, you know comparatively and essentially what they are, nation to nation. By a very few specimens you fix the great leading differences, which are the same throughout. Any one thing is a better representative of its kind than all the words and definitions in the world can be. The sum total is indeed different from the particulars, but it is not easy to guess at any general result without some previous induction of particulars and appeal to experience. What can we reason but from what we know? Again, it is quite wrong. Instead of the most striking illustrations of human nature, to single out the stalest and tritest, as if they were the most authentic and infallible, not considering that from the extremes you may infer the means, but you cannot from the means infer the extremes in any cases. It may be said that the extreme and individual cases may be reported upon us. I deny it, unless it be with truth. The imagination is an associating principle, and has an instinctive perception when a thing belongs to a system, or is an exception to it. For instance, the excesses committed by the victorious besiegers of a town do not attach to the nation committing them but to the nature of that sort of warfare, and are common to both sides. They may be struck off the score of natural prejudices. The cruelties exercised upon slaves, on the other hand, grow out of the relation between master and slave, and the mind intuitively revolts at them as much. The cant about the horrors of the French Revolution is mere cant. Everybody knows it to be so. Each party would have retaliated upon the other. It was a civil war, like that for a disputed secession. The general principle of the right or wrong of the change remained untouched. Neither would these horrors have taken place except from Prussian manifestos and treachery within. There were none in the American and have been none in the Spanish Revolution. The massacre of St. Bartholomew arose out of the principles of that religion which exterminates with fire and sword and keeps no faith with heretics. If it be said that nicknames, party watchwords, bugbears, the cry of no popery, etc., are continually played off upon the imagination, with the most mischievous effect. I answer that most of these bugbears and terms of vulgar abuse have arisen out of abstruse speculation or barbarous prejudice, and have seldom had their root in real facts or natural feelings. Besides, are not general topics, rules, exceptions, endlessly bandied to and fro and balanced against the other by the most learned disputants? Had not three-fourths of all the wars, schisms, heart-burnings in the world begun on mere points of controversy? There are two classes whom I have found given to this kind of reasoning against the use of our senses and feelings in what concerns human nature, these knaves and fools. The last do it because they think their own shallow dogmas settle all questions best without any farther appeal, and the first do it because they know that the refinements of the head are more easily got rid of than the suggestions of the heart, and that a strong sense of injustice, excited by a particular case in all its aggravations, tells more against them than all the distinctions of the jurists. Facts, concrete existences, are stubborn things, and are not so soon tampered with or turned about to any point we please, as mere names and abstractions. Of these last it may be said, a breath can mar them, whom a breath has made, and they are liable to be puffed away by every wind of doctrine, or baffled by every plea of convenience. I wonder that Rousseau gave into this cant about the want of soundness in rhetorical and imaginative reasoning, 
and was so fond of this subject as to make an abridgment of Plato's rhapsodies upon it, by which he was led to expel poets from his commonwealth. Thus, two of the most flowery writers are those who have exacted the greatest severity of styles from others. Rousseau was too ambitious of an exceedingly technical and scientific mode of reasoning, scarcely attainable in the mixed questions of human life, as may be seen in his social contract, a work of great ability but extreme formality of structure, and it is probable that he was led into this error in seeking to overcome his too great warmth of natural temperament, to indulge merely the impulses of passion. Burke, who was a man of fine imagination, had the good sense, without any of this false modesty, to defend the moral uses of the imagination, and is himself one of the grossest instances of its abuse. It is not merely the fashion among philosophers. The poets also have got into a way of scouting individuality as beneath the sublimity of their pretensions and the universality of their genius. The philosophers have become mere logicians and their rivals mere rhetoricians. For as these last must float on the surface and are not allowed to be harsh and crabbed and recondite like the others, by leaving out the individual, they become commonplace. They cannot reason and they must declaim. Modern tragedy in particular is no longer like a vessel making the voyage of life and tossed about by the winds and waves of passion, but is converted into a handsomely constructed steamboat that is moved by the sole expansive power of words. Lord Byron has launched several of these ventures lately, if ventures they may be called, and may continue in the same strain as long as he pleases. We have not now a number of dramatis personae affected by particular incidents, and speaking according to their feelings, or as the occasion suggests, but each mounting the rostrum and delivering his opinion on fate, fortune, and the entire consummation of things. The individual is not of sufficient importance to occupy his own thoughts or the thoughts of others. The poet fills his page with grand pensée. He covers the face of nature with the beauty of his sentiments and the brilliancy of his paradoxes. We have the subtleties of the head instead of the workings of the heart, and the possible justifications instead of the actual motives of conduct. This all seems to proceed on a false estimate of individual nature and the value of human life. We have been so used to count by millions of late that we think the units that compose them nothing and are so prone to trace remote principles that we neglect the immediate results. As an instance of the opposite style of dramatic dialogue, in which the persons speak for themselves and to one another, I will give by way of illustration a passage from an old tragedy in which a brother has just caused his sister to be put to violent death. Bosola. Fix your eyes here. Ferdinand. Constantly. Bosola. Do you not weep? Other sins only speak. Murther shrieks out, The elements of water moistens the earth, but blood flies upward and bedews the heavens. Ferdinand, cover her face, mine eyes dazzle, she died young. Basola, I think not so, her infelicity seemed to have years too many. Ferdinand, she and I were twins, and should I die this instant, I have lived, her time to a minute. How fine is the constancy, with which he first fixes his eye in the dead body, with a forced courage, and then as his resolution wavers, how natural is his turning his face away, and the reflection that strikes him on her youth and beauty and untimely death, and the thought that they were twins, and his measuring his life by hers up to the present period, as if all that were to come of it were nothing. Now I would fain to ask whether there is not in this contemplation of the interval that separates the beginning from the end of life, of a life too so varied from good to ill, and of pitiable termination of which the person speaking has been the willful and guilty cause, enough to give the mind pause. Is not that revelation as if it were of the whole extent of our being, which is made by the flashes of passion and stroke of calamity, a subject sufficiently staggering to have place in legitimate tragedy? Are not the struggles of the will with untoward events and the adverse passions of others as interesting and instructive in the representation as reflections on the mutability of fortune, or in the inevitableness of destiny, or in the passions of men in general? The tragic muse does not merely utter muffled sounds, but we see the paleness on the cheek, and the lifeblood gushing from the heart. The interest we take in our own lives, in our successes or disappointments, and the home feelings that arise out of these, when well described, are the clearest and truest mirror 
in which we can see the image of human nature. For in this sense, each man is a microcosm. What he is, the rest are. Whatever his joys and sorrows are composed of, theirs are the same, no more, no less. One touch of nature makes the whole world kin. But it must be the genuine touch of nature, not the outward flourishes and varnish of art, the spouting, oracular, didactic figure of the poet no more answers to the living man than the lay figure of the painter does. We may well say to such a one, Thou hast no speculation in those eyes, that thou dost glare with, thy bones are marrowless, thy blood is cold. Man is, so to speak, an endless and infinitely varied repetition, and if we know what one man feels, we so far know what a thousand feel in the sanctuary of their being. Our feeling of general humanity is at once an aggregate of a thousand different truths, and it is also the same truth a thousand times told. As is our perception of this original truth the root of our imagination, so will the force and richness of the general impression proceeding from it be. The boundary of our sympathy is a circle which enlarges itself according to its propulsion from the center, the heart. If we are imbued with a deep sense of individual weal or woe, we shall be awestruck at the idea of humanity in general. If we know little of it but its abstract and common properties, without their particular application, their force or degrees, we shall care just as little as we know either about the whole or the individuals. If we understand the texture and vital feeling, we then can fill up the outline, but we cannot supply the former from having the latter given. Moral and poetical truth is like expression in a picture. The one is not to be attained by smearing over a large canvas, nor the other by bestriding a vague topic. In such matters, the most pompous skillists are accordingly found to be the greatest contemners of human life. But I defy any great tragic writer to despise that nature which he understands, or that heart which he has probed, with all its rich bleeding materials of joy and sorrow. The subject may not be a source of much triumph to him, from its alternate light and shade, but it can never become one of supercilious indifference. He must feel a strong reflex interest in it, corresponding to that which he has depicted in the characters of others. Indeed, the object and end of playing, both at the first and now, is to hold the mirror up to nature, to enable us to feel for others as for ourselves, or to embody a distinct interest out of ourselves by the force of imagination and passion. This is summed up in the wish of the poet, to feel what others are, and to know myself a man. If it does not do this, it loses both its dignity and its proper use. End of section 6. Recording by Dave Gower.